Hey everyone, it's Anise and welcome back to Draw Curiosity. Small life update, I now live in Los Angeles, and as many of you know, the US was recently graced with a total solar eclipse. So I thought it would be pretty nice to go and see that in person and join the 1 in 10,000 exclusive club of people who have witnessed a total solar eclipse. Of course, I was absolutely on the wrong side of the country, so I did embark on one of the most American of activities to rectify that. A road trip all the way from California over to Texas. So, come join me! Now, as the road trip began, we did notice that the weather forecast wasn't looking very promising for Eclipse Day. In fact, it seemed like there were going to be storm clouds forming that afternoon over the entire path of totality, from Canada all the way down to Mexico. But especially, of course, in Texas, which is where we were going. So we were all checking the weather apps like a hawk every single day to determine where might possibly be the most promising place to watch the eclipse that we could also reasonably reach from what would be our base, Austin. I do have to say the road trip was a lot of fun. I kind of get the hype now. I saw the Grand Canyon where I got to test out my schmancy new lens for the first time. Also stopped by White Sands and Roswell, where I checked out the UFO museum. And finally, I made my way to Austin, Texas, where the day before the eclipse, I figured I should test out and rehearse my full setup on the subject du jour, the sun. So let's talk about my setup. Now, I had an 150 to 600 millimeter lens. This was attached to a 1.4x teleconverter, and this is on my Canon camera, which has a 1.6x crop factor. So all of this together basically turns my camera into a mini telescope. And if I am pointing such a device as this at the sun, I also needed an appropriate solar filter, because otherwise the sensor would start smoking within seconds. And in fact, when I was doing this, I actually imaged the sun better than I've ever seen before. You could see the sunspots. Sunspots are pretty interesting. They're little dark areas on the sun's photosphere, photo meaning light, and it's the sun's visible surface. Sunspots are very active regions on the surface of the sun, and they are caused by an intense magnetic flux, 2,500 times stronger than our Earth's own magnetic field, that reaches the surface from the sun's interior. As the magnetic pressure increases, the atmospheric pressure decreases, which lowers the temperature by around 2000 degrees Celsius relative to its surroundings, because the concentrated magnetic field actually then prevents new hot gas from flowing in from the sun's core up to the surface. And therefore, that leads to the darker color on the photosphere. So you know, the hotter it is, the brighter it is, and the cooler it is, the darker it is. Some sunspots are really short-lived, they only last a few hours to days, and then there are others that actually last for a really long time, even up to several months. So there are some sunspots here, the tiny ones could be new, the big one could be more mature, I don't actually know. I tried looking it up, but I couldn't find out. And the sun actually goes through an 11 year solar cycle where its magnetic field flips, and that means that the north and the south pole switch places. And during this time, it oscillates between a very active and stormy surface where many sunspots may be observed a day to a much quieter phase where very little activity may be observed at all over a very extended period of time. And this is important because even seemingly small changes in sun activity are known to have effects on Earth's climate. But the intricacies of that would definitely be a subject for a different video. Now the reason everyone was really 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 excited about this year's eclipse was because it falls during a period of high solar activity. More sunspots means a higher chance of other exciting solar activity, such as solar flares and coronal mass ejections, which can be much more easily observed during the total solar eclipse, as the chunky moon blocks out the brightness of the photosphere, and that allows us to observe the chromosphere around it. And if there are more sunspots, there may be more solar mass ejections coming out and being seen into the chromosphere. But anyway, as mentioned, there was a threat of clouds, so I didn't actually know if we would witness the promised prominences. So the morning of the 8th rolls around, we depart at 5am from our hotel in Austin to beat what honestly, compared to LA, was absolutely non-existent traffic. 
And based on our latest weather checks, we decided that Kerrville was probably the best place to see the eclipse. It's bang smack in the middle of the path of totality, and there just so happens to be a life-size replica of Stonehenge along with an observation event for the eclipse. So I figured if worse came to worse and the sun was completely obscured by the clouds, this just seemed like a really fun place to be regardless. So I began setting up at 8am and I had a four hour lead up to the partial eclipse so I was actually hoping to have ample time to do all of this presenting on site. However, five minutes after I set up, a radio station set up as well, foiling all of my plans of presenting anything live as I do not want to be copyright struck by any Kerrville radio station's greatest hits on the sun and the moon. Um, also, unfortunately, it seems like I also caught COVID. Once upon a time I was falling in love. I took a few days off to rest and now a week later, but you know, better later than never, I'm better. And honestly, I've been away on a multi-year hiatus, so what's an extra week on that? Anyway, welcome back to me and to Draw Curiosity. So anyway, of course, the moment the eclipse began, Murphy's Law dictated that not only would a radio station start playing their music, but the cloud cover was going to increase as well. Of course, if it was too cloudy to see the eclipse, we had been promised that totality would be extra spooky and extra dark. And I do have to say, although I am healthily jealous of all of my friends who did succeed at driving further north and landing in cloudless spots for totality, there was something really fun about doing one's best to catch fleeting glances of the action as the odd gap between the clouds would manifest. The partial eclipse was like slowly observing a pizza being eaten, a solar Pac-Man being formed, as the sunspots and the solar surface were slowly but surely concealed by the moon. The cloud cover got significantly worse as it progressed. It's worth saying it is kind of incredible that we got to see anything at all on camera. However, the real fun came as 1.30pm approached. In the minutes approaching totality, there was a very noticeable light and temperature drop. Even along with the radio station's best efforts, animals went quiet, except cricket. And then it happened. Everything went dark, or pretty dusky. I got a quick glimpse of Bailey's beads through the clouds, which, as the moon finally obscures the sun, its reflections bounce and pass through the moon's mountains and valleys, resulting in a beautiful resplandescent optical phenomena on the edge of the moon, which you see in all of the eclipse photos that came out. Totality lasted 4 minutes and 27 seconds, and despite the fact that most of it was completely concealed where I was, it was absolutely magical. Every time a hint of sun was just slightly visible through the clouds, the crowds clapped, almost encouraging the clouds to part. Apparently, this is actually a documented meteorological phenomena. Low-level clouds are actually known to dissipate during a solar eclipse. Once about 15% of the sun is blocked and the temperature has dropped by around 6 degrees Celsius, low-level cloud cover drops by a factor of 4, which obviously can lead to better visibility. I can't say that's exactly what happened here, as we also had quite high cloud cover and it seemed to just get worse, but towards the very, very, very end of totality, we got the most amazing, most impressive view of the corona and the chromosphere's prominences. I talked about the photosphere earlier being the sun's visible surface. The chromosphere is the layer directly above, found beneath the sun's upper atmosphere, and extends out for around 2,000 kilometers. When the brightness of the photosphere is conveniently blocked by our friend the moon, the hues and colors of the chromosphere come through to us humble observers on Earth. The powerful magnetic fields beneath force prominences and arches of looping plasma out into the chromosphere, emitting the characteristic red colour. And if you're curious why it's red, it's because the vast majority of these emissions are hydrogen atoms. And whenever an electron in a hydrogen atom makes the transition from energy level n equals 3 to n equals 2, it emits a red wavelength, which is what we're able to detect all the way down on Earth. 
And right at the end of totality, we once again got a brief flash of baby speeds returning behind the clouds. And almost as if nothing had happened at all, the lights came back on. And we all resumed life as it was before, but with the unique experience of having witnessed totality. In this time, I also had the pleasure to meet quite a lot of other people who attended this event. I met other photographers, an astronomy professor from Rochester, two wizards, a French journalist, and a very generous man who gave me an extra piece of solar filter paper. I saw telescopes, alien outfits, the largest concentration of expensive camera gear I have ever seen, and I have been on plenty of TV sets and YouTube spaces. So overall, I would say, 8 out of 10 experience, 0.5 deduction for the clouds, 0.5 deduction because one of my nails broke, which I didn't mention, but I got Eclipse themed nails, and a minus 1 point deduction for getting COVID, because that wasn't on the books. But you know the best part? The next two eclipses are going to pass through Spain, my home country, so that means I'm going to get two chances to do this over in the near future, at least as far as total eclipses go. Anyway, it's really nice to be back. I haven't made a video in such a long time. I've been plotting my return for a while, but I know I've been dragging my heels to coming back and making videos. So I guess it just took a solar eclipse to get me back here. Now, hopefully you're thinking, oh wow, we missed you and your videos so much, Anise. How long will it be till the next one? And the answer is, if you're a Nebula subscriber, there is already a new video from me. It's all about bees and there are many, many reasons why they're so fuzzy and hairy. So if you're excited to learn fun facts that despite my slightly cutesy description actually covers interesting interdisciplinary biomechanics, engineering, biology, then you know where to go. Will that video come to YouTube though? The answer is yes, but not so soon. The video that you just saw actually went up at the end of April, so that will give you an idea of my turnover rate. So I'm going to be uploading following the Nebula First formula. That means that all of my new videos will go on Nebula first. Then when I make a second video that goes up on Nebula, that first video then becomes available on YouTube. So if you want to be the first to see my new videos, then please feel free to support me over on Nebula. Now if you don't know what Nebula is, you might have seen me do sponsor reads for it before. It's a platform for indie creators by creators that is actually invested in supporting high quality content and the people who make it. So a Nebula subscription not only goes towards directly supporting creators like me with an ad-free platform, and that means you won't be getting reads like this in the video, but it also provides access to additional and exclusive content such as Nebula Originals and content that is exclusively produced on Nebula such as everything that Lindsay Ellis produces. So if you would like to access Nebula and see my next video about bees right away, um, you can use my code, which will give you a 40% off discount. And you can do that by going to go.nebula.tv forward slash curiosity. Also, before you go, I have two further announcements. Firstly, I created a Twitch account, twitch.tv forward slash curiosity. I can't believe I did this. I soft launched it on my Instagram and Patreon over the last month, and turns out I really enjoy streaming. So. If you want even more Ines content in between videos, you can catch me over there. I'm doing a lot of co-working streams during the weekdays, um, and then the odd chatty streams during my evenings. I am probably going to be hosting one 48 hours or so after posting new videos, so check the pinned comment to find out when the next one of these streamed is scheduled for, because it will be great to see more people there. And finally, I have revamped my Discord server, and you are invited to join. So that is all. Back to me from the past. And as ever, I want to say thank you so much to my Patreons on Patreon, who I hope are very delighted to see the return of Joe Curiosity, um, to my road trip mates, Ian, Darren and Dean, who helped planning the trip and capturing the footage and all of the fun adventures that we had along the way. And of course, thanks to you for clicking and watching all the way for the end. It's really appreciated, especially after such a long time not making videos. And as always, thank you so much for watching me, and I'll see you in the next one.